glorified in the mighty name of Jesus. Be thou exalted, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Father, we commit ourselves to you today. We know that we are not wise, we are not righteous, but you are all in all. And that is why we depend on you. Holy Spirit, come and take charge of this class. Teach us yourself. The specific words that we need to hear that will bring about our deliverance and salvation, Father, send such words in the mm -hmm. mighty name of Jesus. Open up our heart, let our heart be the good ground where your word would dwell and will begin to germinate and will begin to bear fruit in the mighty name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Lord, make us not only hearers, but doers of your word. Mm -hmm. Glorify your name in our lives. Mm -hmm. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. 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 Praise the living Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. So, how are things? Um, how are things going on with us? How? How's our spiritual life? How's our prayer life? Uh, our relationship with God, how is it going? It's not where it was. Okay. Now I'm more conscious when I'm doing certain things. <laughs> so I tend to, yeah, I tend to be more, put myself all, ask the Holy Spirit to guide me in a lot of things. Okay. Yes, that is one change that I've noticed on my end. Okay. Yeah, and then also I have, I'm noticing more and more that I'm beginning to put myself in the other person's shoes even before I react or do something. Okay. okay. Yes. Uh, A prayer would um, make us even get better because we are all we are all work in progress, all of us. Um, there is always. There is always um, in room for improvement. There is always areas we need to work on. Uh -huh. the, only, the only person that don't, don't, don't need anything to work on is the person that's already gone up there. As long as yes. we're here, we uh -huh. need to keep pressing on. We need to keep True. pressing on until uh -huh. we get to the mark. We'll get there in Jesus' name. Amen. The, the study we are looking at today is titled biblical fasting and praying or you can call it fasting and prayer the biblical fasting and prayer it's mm. it's there is the biblical at the beginning because it is not every fasting that is biblical you see there are some there are some tests you want to do at the hospital they will tell you to fast before you do it mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. Uh -huh. So it's not not all, all those ones. There are some fastings out there. Uh, people do. From what I even heard, there are some um, occultic uh, groups that they observe some level of fasting to mm -hmm. carry out what they need to do. So that will not be said to be biblical. Even though, even though, all those they took their roots from the Bible. They have been. Um, Especially the occultic ones, they have been adulterated, they have been tweaked to suit their demonic purposes. So we're looking at the biblical fasting. If I read the introduction here, it says biblical fasting is imperative for members of the body of Christ. In other words, it is very important. It's not a good to, to do, it is a must do if we are going to be seen as true Christians. It mm -hmm. must do. Okay. It is essential, among other things, very essential. I mean, to deal with the flesh, that fallen nature. And now let's, let, let me quickly make something clear. When the Bible talks about the flesh, you know, mm -hmm. you know this is my flesh. It's not talking about this. Because this has got nothing to do with us. Is this, this has got nothing in us, okay? 
when the Bible talks about the flesh, it's talking about the old man, the real self in us, the real, that's in the self, the, 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 the person in us that makes decision. That is the flesh that the Bible is talking about, not the skin. Because the skin has nothing to, I mean, the, this flesh goes wherever is is taken to. It has no no choice in the matter. Mm. So it is not the skin that the, that controls us, but the old man, that old nature, that fallen state of man. So which is still much around. So even though we are born again, even though we because when we are born again, our spirit man is transformed. Let me to try and explain. A man is um, what they call tri, tripartite in nature, just like the, um, the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. A man has the spirit, the soul, and the body. Now, the body is the outer case, is the con container of the soul and the spirit so even though the body is what we see the body is what we look those expressions that we see on the face they are as a result of what is going on within that is what brings out the expression now somebody can try to fake a few expressions but not for long the real being inside comes out so when a person becomes born again that spirit in that man is translated the spirit of god comes into that person and changes that inner man of that person which is his spirit now don't forget that that person still has a soul he still has body so even though the spirit has now been transformed as it's, a, it's now a spirit being, so to say, his soul is still intact. Hence, Paul was talking to us in Romans chapter 12 that we should renew our mind because that mind, if it's not renewed, that soul, if it's not refreshed, if it's not reset to the, if, allow me to use the word, factory setting, what God originally created, where the soul is governed by the spirit because that was what God created. God created a situation where um, Adam's spirit governed his soul and his body. Hence, he could speak to God, he could see God, he could live with God, and he could still make decisions in, in line with God's will. But the moment Adam disobeyed, don't forget that the Bible said, the day that you eat this fruit, you will die. God was talking about his spirit. So that day, his spirit died. His soul was empowered over his spirit. So the soul began to, to control both the spirit and, his, and the body. Whenever the soul decides to go, the body has no choice. The body goes there. So that is why a natural man is controlled by his affections, his passions, his desires. And all these things I just mentioned about, they reside within the soul. So when the Bible is talking about the flesh, so to say, it's not talking about the skin. It's talking about the self, the real self of that, of that man, the self that makes decision, that the passion, his passions, his desires, is, is um, wants, the lusts, and all these things, they are captured within the soul of a man. Within the soul. So the Bible calls the soul, or it is real self. So what we're saying in, in essence is that when that person, that soul, that spirit is born again, now that soul that makes decisions, where decision is made, where the passion operates, the, the will, his desires, that soul now needs to be refreshed so that he can begin to make the right decisions in line with the spirit of God that is now in his spirit. 
And once that soul makes the right decision, and then his body carries out the whatever is done, because the body is just he just uh, um, more like a robot. He's told what he's told to do. Now, when the soul is refreshed with the word of God, and the word of God begins to take charge of the soul, that man can then begin to operate with the in line with what God created in, in, in the beginning, where his spirit is empowered. Amen. And the soul is, is brought down through humility. And then the spirit begins to suggest, then the soul begins to carry Fine, out, no, 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 and then no, the no, body no, no. begins to implement. I'm trying to explain this so that we understand by the time I begin talking about what fasting actually does. The topic again is fasting and prayer, biblical fasting and prayer. All right. So Paul said something in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27. He says, he said, but I keep under my body. I bring it into subjection. He's trying to say that he disciplines his body. Now, when he's talking about that, was he talking about this flesh? Because if he's, if he's talking about disciplining his flesh, you would expect that he will, he will get something to inflict pain on this skin or to put pain on the body. No, that was not what Paul was saying. Paul was talking about putting himself under check, proper discipline, disciplining his, his appetite, his affection, his passion, his desire, his will. That was what Paul was talking about. So that, so that after he has preached the gospel, he himself will not be a castaway. Of course, one of the ways by which you, you, put, you discipline that body, that is by fasting, by fasting. One, that's one of the ways. Now, let's now look to define what fasting is. What is fasting? Okay. Fasting means abstinence, abstaining from something. That is fasting. You, ab you, you, you separate yourself, you abstain, from certain things. That is what fasting means. So in, in the biblical setting, fasting means abstaining from food and drinks depending on a duration. So for a particular time, you abstain from food, you abstain from, from drink. Now, even though we say abstaining from food and drink, it has a purpose. And the purpose you're trying to achieve will define what you will need to do during the time of fasting. You understand what that means? So even though it's specifically talking about food and drink, there is a purpose for which you're trying to abstain from food and drink. So that purpose, in order for you to achieve the purpose, you, you will then need to then begin to also abstain from some other things so that you can achieve the main reason why you are fasting. Because it would not make sense if you are abstaining from food and drink, and then you sit, um, you go to a cinema and spend the whole day watching movies and movies upon movies, then that's, the purpose will be defeated. We would look more into that as we move along. Okay, so thus fasting is an act of denying oneself of things that give us pleasure. Now it's getting more clearer, getting much clearer. Things that give us pleasure. The things that give us pleasure. So you're looking at that, it's not only food and drink that give us pleasure. So what, what it means is that when you are fasting, you will look at things that you naturally do that you derive pleasure from. Yours will be different from mine. Maybe, Mine is, I'm just saying, maybe for, um, just for explanation, maybe mine is that I love going on Facebook or I love going on Instagram, spend time, um, uh, or, I, I, or I have some people I chat with on social media. When I'm fasting and I'm abstaining from food and drink, I would have to abstain from that as well. Because if I don't, that would take the place, it will replace the food and the drink, 
I will derive excitement and pleasure from it. I will not be able to achieve the purpose for which I am fasting. I hope, I hope it's, it's clear. So it's not just only food and drink. There are also things that bring pleasure to us. The things that we have seen from. And the view is to suppress the flesh. Because the main thing we are trying to achieve is to, to lower the voice of the flesh. The, flesh, the voice of the flesh is so loud, that is why we, we find it hard to hear the voice of God. God is not a noisemaker, and God is not a talkative. When God speaks to us, and I want you and I to know that God speaks to us, that's the truth of the matter. Now, a different thing is whether we hear him speak to us. And I remember I painted a picture of you going to the market, a very noisy market with a, a young child, maybe your niece, maybe your daughter, maybe your son or um, your, your friend's son or whatever. And after a while, you, the two of you separate. Now you are in the midst of the market at the heat of the noise, where, the, where everywhere is so loud, noise is so loud. And there is a car horn, there is um, music being played, everywhere is so loud. And then that young child is not calling, calling you because he's really looking for you. Or you can even say your dad is somewhere there, raising his voice, calling you. You are not going to be able to hear because there's so much going on around. Now that is what's going on within our soul. That is what is happening within our soul. That is, that is there's so much noise. You know, various things that you are thinking, the experiences you have had, the things that you have been, you, you have been told, the, your, your culture, your tradition, all those things, they form various type of noise that has suppressed the voice of God in us. Now imagine a situation where you can, if, if it's possible, you can just snap your finger and every other sound in the market goes quiet all at once. The shouting from various people, the people calling um, themselves, people fighting, people buying and selling, the sound of music all over the place, everything goes quiet. And in the same with the same volume, the person that was calling you before that you didn't hear called you. That the voice of that person will suddenly sound so loud. Not the person, it's not that the person has just raised his or her voice, it's because every other sound around you has gone quiet. And that's the same thing. That's the reason why your the same volume of your voice that used to speak in the morning, if you speak like that at night. People be telling you that you are making noise. You have not raised your voice because the environment has gone quieter. So that's what we tend to want to achieve when we are fasting. We want to silence our voice so that the voice of God can sound louder to us. Not that if, God will not raise his voice louder, okay? Is that we now need to tone down the, the voices, the noise around us so that we can pick the voice of God. Again, if I take the last thing, what I read before, it says that fasting is an act of denying oneself of things that give us pleasure with a view to suppressing the flesh and uplifting the spirit. Talking about Adam and Eve, their spirit was lifted up. Hence, they could hear the voice of God. Hence, they could see God. Hence, they could, you know, the, we, we all know that the spirit controls the physical. That is why when you see people who are possessed and they operate under the demonic spirit, you see them, people run away from them, they are afraid of them because they, they also know how to lift up their own, that spirit of God or the demonic spirit in them they know how to suppress their soul to amplify that demonic spirit. And then because of that, they are seen to be powerful than the natural person. The principle is the same with the kingdom. 
we have to be able to suppress our, our body so that the spirit of God, our spirit can be lifted where we can begin to do the, the spirit of God and our spirit can communicate clearly. And then we can begin to operate in the realm of the spirit. It's the same principle that the demonic people do. Amen. So fast, fast could be divided as follows. We're looking at now different types of fasting. And here, to be honest with you, there are only two that we have. Now, various people have talked about various types of fasting. I'm not sure of that, but we are talking about two, two different types. Number one is called the absolute fast. Now, the absolute fast is those type that Jesus did when he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. It's absolute. No breaking in between. Or like Moses, when he went, he, he climbed Mount Sinai and he went to commune with God and he was there for 40 days and 40 nights and God gave him the Ten Commandments. Those, those are called absolute fast. Because when he was up there, there was nothing for him to eat or drink. He was just there in the presence of God. Now you can, it doesn't mean that one must do that for 40 days. It does not mean that it has to be 40 days. It can be for one day, it can be for three days, it can be for five days, seven days, 21 days. And I mean, it is between you and God. But that some people call it stretch. It's called absolute fasting. And to do that, they normally advise that after three days of that, it is advised that you begin to drink water, not gulp water, or just take water little to keep your intestine, you know, to keep it there so that it doesn't stick together, to keep your throat, it doesn't get too dry, and then at least you can move around. Because from what it says, um, Medical um, science makes us understand that the body of man can do without food for a longer time than water. So there's a certain amount of days that our body cannot do without or can do without water. So for health reason, so that you can still keep going, it's advised that you drink water um, at some times to keep yourself okay, but at least you are still able to pray and do what you need to do. So that is after 30 days. But for the first 30 days, you can still do without water. You can do without water for 30 days. But depending on someone's health, definitely. I mean, talking about health issues, um, um, one might, might be advised to drink water not drinking a glass of water all the way, but is to have some, some sip carefully. So that is talking about absolute fast. Then there is this, your second one, which you're talking about, is the, the one that is, is mostly done, I call it the normal fast, where we fast and break at six o'clock. At six o'clock, you know. And then it's also advised that for people who are doing um, work that is hectic, people possibly they are driving and then they have to, they need a lot of concentration to do the work and they are observing some, some of this fast. It's also advised that they, they drink water or they could even do some other type of liquid, maybe not, maybe not juice, because juice can be, depending on the type of juice, could be acidic and it could affect the body when you are not eating. Um, maybe um, some tea, beverage, and things like that. Or maybe um, light pop and all those things, just to make sure. And when I say drinking, that doesn't mean that you won't have to go and drink a bowl. Just to, I mean, as little as possible. At least to keep you okay keep you healthy, but yet you are still spiritually sound to do your spiritual exercise. So 
the next question we need to ask is who should fast? Who is fasting for? Who should fast? Now, um, there are people, you know, Christianity has become so, so funny the way we have turned Christianity to be. You hear about people who would um, you go and meet your pastor and then um, your pastor will fast on your behalf. <laughs> I don't know where that is in the Bible. I don't know where it is in the Bible. Fasting is for every Christian. As a matter of fact, children should have been trained as from their from as they are young to fast. From and as I mean, depending on whenever we decide to begin to train them, maybe not training them to begin to fast from morning till night, but at least from their young age, we begin to teach them to fast maybe from morning till maybe for it maybe be till 10, 10 a.m. Maybe to 12 noon, so that they can begin to understand this. Because by the time they are old, it's something that should be part of our life. And now fasting should not just be that when problem has started, it should be part of our life. It should be part of our life as Christians. Now, as Christian, I'm not saying as a pastor, I'm not talking about pastors, I'm not talking about priests, or talking, you know, I'm talking about as a child of God, born again Christian, we should be fasting. Okay, so who should fast? Number one, individual believers. Individual believers should fast. Individual believers should fast. Now, let's look at um, um, Paul. Now, Paul as a believer, not Paul as an apostle, just as a believer, okay? Because what Paul went through, believers were to we go through them. Let's look at 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians. And can I advise if you, on this one, let's look at, let's look at this passage in the New King James or King James or maybe American Standard Version or English Standard Version. Because if you read some other versions, it will not mention fast. It would mention it will call fast in a, a different language. So that's why I'm saying um, New King James or King James. Second Corinthians chapter six, verse five, first and foremost. Second Corinthians chapter six, verse five. Okay, if I quickly go to King James version. Mm -hmm. Yes, go ahead, ma'am. In stripes, imprisonment, in tumult, in tumults, in labors, in sleeplessness, in fasting. In fasting. Paul was talking about what he went through in fasting. You see, Paul was an apostle. However, his teachings are not sent to apostles, they're sent to regular Christians people like you and I, so that he said, follow me as I follow Christ. Let's also quickly look at the same Second Corinthians chapter 11, chapter 11, verse 27. Paul also said this, he said, in weariness, in painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fasting often in cold and nakedness. So Paul was sharing his experience and what he did, what he went through. So fasting, he did that very often. And we could, we could also see that in the life of Jesus Christ. And we can see that in the life of any, any apostle. And then by the time we now look at a pastor, a true pastor who should be a leader. And the two thing I like to bring out here is that we as Christians, when you have someone as a father figure, as a pastor in your church, the idea should be now, quote unquote, a true pastor, a true pastor, a real pastor of God. Okay, because I have to be careful here. The point there is to be that you as a congregant should follow that pastor as he follow Christ. So when your pastor is someone that fasts often, and he prays well, and he evangelizes well, you as a con congregant, 
you have only seen an example to follow. That's why it's called a leader. He's your leader. So if he's a leader and you're not following him, then he's not your leader. Praise the Lord. So an individual believer should fast. And then secondly, group of believers. Group of believers. What you, yourself and myself, we decide to come together and say, okay, for, sort, for a particular issue that we have, let us join our faith together and fast on this particular situation. Or within your church, your church can call a fast within your church and say, let us fast on this particular situation. Let's look at the book of Acts chapter 13, verse one to three. Acts chapter 13. Now you can read any, you can read any version of the Bible on this one. Chapter 13, verse one to three. Let me see this in Good News Translation. Can we read? Yes, please. Now in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lu Lucius of Serene, Manen, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrat, and Saul, as the minister to the Lord and fasted. The Holy Spirit said, now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And then verse 3, Ima. Oh, verse 3. Then having fasted, then having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they, they sent them away. Praise the Lord. The point yeah. next is that you see that these are a group of believers. First and foremost, even though you had their prophets, you had their teachers, you had their apostles, but first and foremost, this is a group of believers came together and prayed and fasted. As a result of them waiting on God, the Holy Spirit spoke and said, separate unto me Barnabas and, and Paul for the work I have called them to do. And after they have prayed and fasted, they laid hand on them and they sent them forth to do the work that God has called them to do. So as a church, as a fellowship, as a unit in the church, as a department in the church, it should be things that we should be doing regularly. The church should call a fast. I remember, I mean, for those of us that are 10 redeemed, that's why this year, for example, beginning of this year, we fasted for 63 days. That's a congregational fasting for the whole redeemed. And I'm sure any other church where we belong to will be doing things similar. But then if you, are, if you belong to a department in the church, your department should also, at a point in time, should decide to fast and pray. Or if you belong to a fellowship, should also call a time together where you fast and pray. So that's the second group of people that should fast. Number one is the individual believer. Number two, group of believers. Number three, interestingly, in the, the answer to this question again, there is no pastor there no apostle no no the third group that should fast which is the last one here is a nation you fast as a nation you see in those days when you had um, i mean in, the, in, in those days when you had nations that are real christian nations you see them calling for fast and i remember during the the first lockdown in brazil the Prime Minister of Brazil, the President of Brazil, call for a nationwide fast and prayer. That's what should be happening in our nations. Let's look at the book of Esther, chapter 4, verse 15 to 17. Esther, chapter 4, 15 to 17. Chapter 4, verse 15 to 17. This was the account of when a, a man called Haman um, decides to alienate the whole nation of, of Jews, all of them. And this was a time where they, they, were, um, they were ruled. I mean, the king there was King Ahaser, Ahaseros in that, in that nation. And they were the one ruling over other nations, including um, the nation of Israel. Some of them had been taken captive, one of which was Esther. 
and Mordecai. And some of them all over the all over the old um, territory were still there. And then the guy called Aman planned, of course, instigated by the by 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 devil to kill all the Jews. And when it came to Esther, look at what Esther has got to say. Esther sent Mordecai this reply: Go and get all the Jews in Shusha together. Hold a fast and pray for me. Don't eat or drink anything for three days. In other words, this is they should observe absolute fast for three good days. Three days and three nights. So that tells us the absolute fast. My servants, women, and I will be doing the same. After that, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. If I must die for doing it, I will die. Mordecai then left and did everything that Esther had told him to do. So this is all seeing a nation coming together to fast. The whole nation coming together. Let's also look at the book of Jonah chapter 3. Jonah chapter 3 verse 5 to 9. Now this one is a case where you know, God sent the prophet Jonah to go to the land of Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was the capital city of the old Assyrian um, kingdom, if you put it that way. The kingdom of Assyria, the, 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 the capital of that Assyria was Nineveh, was a city. And they, were, they did terrible things against God. And God asked Jonah to go and warn them. And when they were warned, look at what they called to do. Jonah, sorry, Jonah chapter 3, verse 5 to 9. Jonah chapter 3, verse 5 to 9. The people of Nineveh believed God's message that was declared through Jonah. So they decided that everyone should fast. And all the people from the greatest to the least, they put on sackcloth to show that they had repented. When the king of Nineveh heard about it, he got up from his throne, took off his robe, put on sackcloth, and sat down in ashes. He sent out a proclamation to the people of Nineveh. This is an order from the king and his officials. No one is to eat anything. All persons, cattle and sheep are forbidden to eat or drink. All persons and animals must wear sackcloth. Everyone must pray endlessly to God and must give up their wicked way, their wicked behavior and their evil actions. Perhaps God will change his mind. Perhaps it will stop being angry and we will not, we will not die. Now, that's a country coming together or calling a fast and then coming together to fast, to seek the face of God in repentance. So that is the third group of people, of persons who should fast. Number one, individual believer. Number two, group of believers coming together. Number three, nation. You see that he didn't talk about um, a pastor or a prophet because a pastor, a prophet, an apostle is first and foremost a believer. So because if we start talking about prophet and all, and all that here, um, then we will now begin to downgrade ourselves and say, okay, other, all, those ones are pastors, so they should fast anyway than we. We should just hold on and hide under the umbrella of our pastor. No. Believers should fast. Number three question we need to ask uh, or answer is, what is fasting? What is fasting set to achieve? Or let's put it this way, when we are fasting, what are the things that we should be doing when we are fasting? What are there some set things that we should try and be observing? So fasting should not only be that, okay, I'm not, I'm not eating, I'm not drinking, but there are some certain things, there are some checklist. I should try and make sure that I'm ticking when I'm fasting. We find it in the book of Isaiah chapter 58, verse 6 to 9. Isaiah 58, verse 6 to 9. Isaiah 58, verse 6 to 9. I'll read from here. I'm reading Good News Translation. And when we read, after we have read it, and I will just itemize all those things that we are going to we're going to read there are eight eight items that we're going to read from that those two verses 
He says, the kind of fasting I want is this. Now, this is God speaking here. This is the kind of fasting I want. Number one, remove the chains of oppression and the yoke of injustice. And let the oppressed go free. Share your food with the hungry and open your homes to the homeless. Four, give clothes to those who have nothing to wear and do not refuse to help your relatives. Then my favor will shine on you. Now we have talked about those things that are required. Now look at the results. Then my favor will shine on you like the morning sun and your wounds will be quickly healed. I will always be with you to save you. My presence will protect you on every side. When you pray, I will answer you. When you call to me, I will respond. You see that from verse six to seven gives us some conditions to fulfill. Some conditions to fulfill in addition to our not eating and drinking. So eating and drinking is not the ultimate. Eating and drinking is the, is the base. Then there are some things to fulfill in verse six, and se- verse six and seven. Then he then says, it will be with us and he will answer our prayer. Now let's quickly itemize those things. Number one, he says, lose the bands of wickedness. Lose the band of wickedness. Good news translation says that you remove the chains of oppression. In other words, you see someone that has been oppressed, you help them. So when we are fasting, this is, is a time to be helpful to people. It's a time to give. Is it number two, to undo heavy burdens, people who are oppressed, people who are under, who are in captivity, people who are suffering. The time of fasting is to help those people. It's not just about not eating and drinking alone. It also talks about to set the oppressed free. And then to break every yoke. To give bread to the hungry. So you see somebody who is in need, you help them. And this is where some, 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 some other religion, and even better than the general population of Christianity. See some of these other religions when they are fasting. See, these are the things they do. They give to the needy. They help people. You see them with open hands. I think we as Christians, we should do more than them. To give bread to the hungry, to restore the poor. There are people around us that are in need. The time of fasting should be the, the time to stretch helping hands to people. To clothe the naked. And then not to hide from our relatives who need our help. So we cannot say that we are fasting, we are praying, you lock yourself up somewhere, which is, 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 is good. But you hear about people who are oppressed, you cannot help them. That is not biblical. It's not biblical. And then, if we look at James chapter 1, verse 27, it summarizes all this that we have read. Let's quickly look at James chapter 1, verse 7. I think the first time I came across this, my eyes popped up. James chapter 1, verse 27. Can I ask somebody to read if you are there, please? James, anyone who is there, please kindly read. James chapter 1, verse 27. Any version of the Bible that you have is okay. Anyone would like to read? Okay, let me read it so that we can save some time. It says, what God the Father considers to be pure and genuine religion is this. Now, hear this. So, it means that when we say we are religious, it's, as far as God is concerned, it's not about how many times we go to church. It's not about the kind of rope we wear going to church. It's not about how we conduct ourselves. About how we speak in tongues. That's not what God considers to be religion. Look at what he says. He says, what God the Father considers to be pure and genuine religion is this. Number one, to take care of orphans and widows in their suffering and to keep ourselves from being corrupted by the world. 
three things. Take care of orphans. Take care of widows who are suffering. And not to, not to corrupt ourselves. Three things. Now, taking care of orphans, taking care of, um, of um, widows. That said, there can be symbolic of people who are in need, who are distressed. People who are vulnerable. People who are in prison. People who, who, who don't have what to eat. People who are suffering. As children of God, we cannot afford to close our eyes to, against these people and pray for five hours and then we think we are okay. Absolutely not. As a matter of fact, I think I normally say this in some of the other classes I've taken, I'll say it now. Let's also, apart from giving in church, that one, I mean, you and I should not even contest that. It's not something we should contest. But that, I mean, giving your tithe and offering is all, we should not, it's not, it's not, it's undebatable. It's a, it should be a standard practice that you should have as a child of God. Okay. In addition to that, we should also be giving to poor people. We should be doing charity. And that's, this is an area where I like the Western world. They do a lot of charity. The people, let's, for example, the, um, um, let's say in the Western world, they help us more than we help ourselves. Now you may say that they are helping us for, for, um, for their ulterior motive. That's a different thing entirely. Look at, look at some foundations that some of these people create, helping people in Africa. At least as far as I know, that are, that, are, that are foundations that come to Nigeria and come to some African countries to, to help with drugs, to help with, um, with our healthcare, at no cost. And when, it, when, when those things get to our countries, our, some of our governments will now, will now put price on those things. Whereas where they're coming from, they're coming for free. I'm sure you have seen a lot of drugs. Maybe you have bought some drugs before. On those drugs, they will say not to be sold. But you will still go, you buy, I think, ah, but this thing says not to be sold. It's because where it's coming from, those people have, they are supplying it them free of charge. When it gets to some places, power will change and things will change. But that's a different, different discussion. But for us as individuals, what are we doing? It is easy for us to talk about our government and criticize them. Let's look inwards. What are you doing as an individual for the people within your vicinity? What are you doing? The people within your sphere of influence, what are you doing to help them? Bible tells us that this is pure and undiluted religion. Again, this is where some other religions are better than the, the general Christians. And it's not supposed to be so. I don't, I mean, I, without mentioning the names of all these other religions, you see some people, you see some of them, you see, they, they'll build a house because they are okay. And then they would provide food and people be going to their houses every day to go and eat and drink. And you see what happens is most of the time they can take advantage of these people. And they, that can happen because we as Christians, we don't, we're not doing the same. You see a wealthy, quote unquote, Christian man, and all he does is to oppress people around him. So how do we then go and take Christianity to people, to the people of this other religion, when they even have some other practice, some practices that are even better than us. I pray God will help us in Jesus' name. So it should be pointed out that these things that we read should, as a child of God, it should not be the time we are fasting and done. It should be part and parcel of us. That's why we read James chapter 1, verse 27. This, should, this is what God considers to be pure and undiluted religion. So that we, when we say that we are Christians and we are religious Christians, these are the things that we should be doing on a day-to-day -day basis. On a day-to-day -day basis. So that if you are a businessman, if you are working somewhere, 
the way you take your tithe religiously and your offering when you go to church, you should also take it religiously that you, out of your, your salary, that is an amount of money that you set aside for helping the needy, helping the poor. Or maybe you have a foundation or you have a charity that you are you have signed to that you're giving them, even if it is no matter how little, no matter how little, to help the cause of some people. There are some places in Africa that they don't have portable water to drink. And there are, there are foundations that support those people. So if you are, God help you identify such foundation every month, even if it is, um, I'm careful to mention the currency, even if it is, say, 100 naira every month or 50 naira or whatever currency you, you spend in, in Kenya, or if I say one pound, one pound is about, um, if I convert one pound to naira, Nigerian currency, I'm talking about um, 600 and something naira. So even if it is some cents, 50, 50p, even if it's that, I mean, what at least what you can afford. Let's not let's not close our eyes to people who are suffering. I pray God will help us in Jesus' name. Please write down First Peter chapter one, verse fifteen and sixteen. Still talking about, I mean, the summary of what we should be doing in fasting and what we should be doing regularly as a as a child of God. First Peter chapter five, chapter one, verse fifteen and sixteen. And then let's quickly look at advantages of fasting. Why do we need to fast? And these are seven of them which we quickly look at. Hope, hopefully, if we still have time, we then go to when do we need to fast? I'm not hoping to finish this study today so that we will complete it to, tomorrow. Don't forget, we are looking at fasting and praying. So we are also, we're still only talking about fasting because the two of them should go hand in hand. If you fast and you are not praying, that is uh, hunger strike or you are just dieting. So it should be fasting and prayer together. So let's look at the advantages of fasting. Number one, as I said before, it puts the flesh down. It subdues the flesh because that flesh is what prevents us from operating in the realm of the spirit. And it is only people that operate in the realm of the spirit that manifest the power and the grace and the goodness of God. For those that operate in the realm of the spirit. That's why you see maybe your pastor um, carrying the spirit of God in them. They come to church one day and they say, mm, thus says the Lord, because he's operating in the spirit. For him to be able to say that, if he has heard something from God, for him to hear those things from God, is a person that is given to fasting. There is no hard, there is no alternative to it. Okay, so for us to put the, the, the flesh down, to subdue the flesh and increase our spiritual capacity, our spiritual strength and our spiritual awareness. And I remember I, I, I use this example. If you are driving your car and you decide to switch on your car stereo and then you went to FM, um, something, maybe 100 FM, and then all of a sudden you start to hear transmission. There's a music playing. The question was the music not being transmitted before you switch on your car stereo? Were you the one that started the transmission? No. That transmission has, has been on since the radio station um, um, went on air. Let's say this the Possibly it's even 24 hour radio station. So for 24 hours, the, the transmission is on, but you will not be able to listen to what they are transmitting until you number one, switch on your radio, and then you tune the frequency of your radio to the, the frequency at which you can pick what is happening in that radio station. And then don't forget that the radio station is not in your car. The radio station is miles away from you. And then you tune your radio to the right frequency. And then you can pick what is happening from that radio station. And then you can hear the person speaking. 
the same way it is. God is speaking at his frequency. So we as children of God, we have to be able to tune our spirit to the frequency of the spirit of God. Now, tune your own spirit to the frequency of the spirit of God so that you can hear what the spirit is saying. God is not going to lower this frequency because again, the radio station is not going to bring their, their set and come into your car and then if you don't tune your own radio to the right frequency, you will not hear. As a matter of fact, I remember there is, there is SW band, there is the MW band, and there is the FM band. I believe the FM band is the higher. I can't remember now. FM is. So your, 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 your system should also be powerful enough to pick that frequency, but you have to tune it to that frequency to get what is being transmitted. So it helps us to lower the flesh so that the spiritual capacity, the spiritual strength and awareness can be strengthened so that we can hear God. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31 says, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. They that wait upon the Lord. Now, fasting, we, all, we also say that when you're fasting, say you are waiting on the Lord in fasting. But that waiting alone, I mean, waiting is not just about fasting. But fasting is part of waiting. Because the, the, the waiting on the Lord now means that you are fasting and you are also patient. You are patient. You are silent in your spirit. You are connected into the spirit. You are praying. And you are hoping in faith to receive something from God. And then you hear what the spirit is saying. And when you hear what the spirit is saying, your spirit is revived. Because when we hear the voice of God, it gives, it gives joy to our spirit. You can imagine a situation where you don't know what to do on a, on a particular subject matter, where you are confused. There is a very serious decision to make, but you don't know what to do. And then you decide to turn to God in fasting. And in the presence of fasting and waiting on God, you hear God give you divine instruction on what to do. Your spirit is revived. You, are, you, you receive supernatural strength in you. And this here was someone who was downcast. Here was someone who was rejected because he had, not, he had no knowledge of what to do. But knowing what to do gives you strength. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Number two, it makes clearer the purpose of God in your situation. Every human being born into this world has a God-given purpose. That is why it's wrong for, for us to think that I can just go and study anything and just go and just find myself doing something. No. To God be the glory, what I'm doing now, I'm fulfilling purpose. God has brought me into this world this that I'm doing right now. This is part of my purpose to sit here today and speak to Sister Winnie and speak to Brother Sunny and speak to Olua, Sister Olua Femi and every other person that might be hearing that will eventually hear me all over, all over the place. So you too have, you have a purpose. So you now need to inquire from God what that purpose is. That is if you have not found out. And that can be obtained in the place of prayer and fasting. Place of prayer and fasting. So fasting helps us to, to define God's purpose for our life. Number three. In the place of fasting, you possess a, you possess a keener perception of divine things and clarity of thoughts. Clarity of thought because you know, your mind will be clear. 
the noise will be, will be lowered. And then in the presence of waiting now, not just fasting alone, waiting as well. And you are sensitive. So you can, put, you can begin to distinctly pick divine information. Your thought becomes clearer. Number four, fasting helps us to kindle and develop faith. Faith is developed in the place of fasting. It, our faith is kindled through fasting. Spiritual fire is kindled in us. When we fast, we pray, and we wait on God, there is a spiritual fire that is kindled in us. And like I said before, this same principle is the same principle that demonic people, they use. I remember a friend of mine shared with us of someone he knew that went in, in the occultic world to collect some demonic powers. I've forgotten the number of days he spent without fasting, also without eating. Some number of days soaked himself into some demonic things for days without eating and drinking. When he came back, he was on fire for, for, for the devil. So all those things, you know, the, the devil didn't create anything. The devil did, only came to copy what God created. So those things that those people use, they picked it from the kingdom of God. And it works for them. So now imagine you and I, born of God, redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. If we apply the principles that we need to apply, it will work for us. It will work for us. Number five, it helps break power of Satan. Let's look at Mark chapter 9, verse 28 and 29. Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9. Verse 28 and 29. To put this in context, this was the account of where a man brought a son to the disciples of Jesus Christ. The son was possessed. And that demon inside of him who want to throw him in the fire at the point, would want to throw him into the water at the point to destroy him. And the disciples, they prayed and prayed and did all those gymnastics and the devil wouldn't go out from this woman. And then Jesus came. And then he said to Jesus, oh, Ah, I have brought this person to your disciples. They couldn't cast this, this thing out. And Jesus looked at the disciples and he rebuked them. Oh, men of little faith. How long would I stay with you? And Jesus um, dealt with the situation. The demon went out. The boy, the boy was okay. Then the disciples came to Jesus Christ and said, how could, we, how could we not do this thing? Why is it that we prayed and we prayed and this thing didn't happen? Hear what Jesus said to them. In verse 28, what Jesus said was the reason why they didn't do, they were not able to do it. Now, verse 28 and 29, Mark chapter 9. I'm reading good news translation. After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately. They were wondering. He only spoke and the demon went out. But we prayed for hours. Nothing happened. He said, why couldn't we drive the, the, the spirit out? Jesus replied, only prayer can drive this kind out. Jesus answered, nothing else. Now, this is where we have to be careful in reading some of this translation. The good news translation that I just read didn't mention fasting. New essential version, I'm sure, didn't mention it. Let's go to New King James Version or King James Version. I'll, I'll just read King James Version. That's why we have to be careful with some of these versions. Look at it, it, it removed fasting from me. It said prayer. Verse 28 and 29. And when he was come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could not we cast him out? Verse 29. And he said to them, This kind can come out forth, but, but sorry, by nothing but by prayer and fasting by prayer and fasting so some things will not happen until we have prayed and fasted or until we have fasted and we have prayed however you want to put it so for to break demonic oppression on one's life we must fast 
is not uh, it's not debatable not debatable we must pray we must fast that's what jesus said to us Jesus showed up in the scene he only spoke a word and the demon went out cried out violently the bible says so if we took want to operate in that realm if we want to we want to live a life that is that is victorious over demons we must be fasting and praying mm -hmm. number six it improves our prayer life tremendously when we fast our prayer life is improved tremendously let's look at luke chapter 11 verse 9 to 11. luke 11 verse 9 to 11. I'll read from here. It says, And I say unto you, Ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Everyone that asketh, receiveth, and he that seeketh, findeth. To him that knocketh, it shall be opened. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? That's just talking about us praying, asking. Don't forget, he said, ask, seek, knock. Look at it, ask. And then you move from the level of asking to the level of seeking. And then you move from the level of seeking to the level of knocking. So you pray and you fast with it. You pray, you're not only praying, you are praying, you are adding fasting to it. And in your fasting, you, you are doing those things we said. You are asking in faith, of course. You are helping the needy. You are helping the poor. You are doing your proper religion as God sees it. You are also living a righteous life. Because James chapter 1, verse 27 says, you help the orphan, you help the widow, and then you separate yourself from things that would defile you, which is sin. And then number seven on this, the last, on that note, the advantages of fasting it enhances continuous flow of anointing the anointing of god it will flow and the reason it will flow is because we are suppressing what is making it not to flow what is making it not to flow is 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 the noise and the sin in our lives so when we are fasting and we so we, we we deal with our flesh it will create an atmosphere for anointing to flow when we are praying as well. Now, the next thing we need to look at, I think I would use, I will close on that note. When do we fast? Or when should we fast? Number one, when we are asking God for divine secrets. When we are asking God for divine secrets, then it is time to fast. There are things that you know that it is only by divine, divine intervention you can get the information. You need to fast at that time. If you please write this down, the book of Daniel. I'm sure if you have read the book of Daniel, you know that there are loads of secrets that were revealed in that book of Daniel. Partly because Daniel was, also, was always a person that was fasting. He prayed and fasted regularly. Prayed and fasted. Hence, God showed him what will happen in, even in the book of Revelation. God showed him divine secrets. God revealed to him. Please write down the book of Daniel chapter 3. Sorry, Daniel chapter 9. I'm so sorry. Daniel chapter 9, verse 3. I think we should read. Let's read that one. Daniel chapter 9, verse 3, and then verse 20 to 22. But we'll, we'll, we'll write down the other ones to read later on. Daniel chapter 9, verse 3. Firstly, and then we'll read 20 to 22. Allow me to read the um, good news transition on this one. Daniel chapter 9, I'll read verse 3 first and foremost. It says, And I prayed earnestly to the Lord. I, and I prayed earnestly to the Lord God, pleading with him, fasting wearied wearing sackcloth sorry and 
sitting in ashes. What happened here was that the, the land of Israel and Judah, they were in captivity in Babylon. And that captivity was what the prophet of Je prophet Jeremiah had prophesied in the book of Jeremiah. And the prophecy was that Israel wa was going to be in captivity in Babylon for 70 years. It was ordained by God. There was nothing they could do about that. As a matter of fact, God told them, anyone that failed to go to Babylon is going to suffer. So anyone that was not, who would not want to suffer the affliction that was going to come must follow them to Babylon. That was the prophecy. So Daniel was one of the people that were in Babylon and God helped Daniel. He was distinct, he was unique. God raised him. He became president of president in Babylon. But Daniel, in the process of searching the scriptures, in the process of searching what, other, what the previous prophet had written by prophecy, it came across what he said. Look at, let's look at read verse, um, let's read from verse two. In the first year of his reign, talking about the reign of Darius, I was studying the sacred books and thinking about the 70 years that Jerusalem should be in ruins, according to what the Lord had told the prophet Jeremiah. So another version says he understood by books, by reading the scrolls, the scriptures. In our own time, we say he read the Bible. So he was able to understand that Israel was only going to, was supposed to be in, in captivity for 70 years. But here they were, the 70 years had passed and they were still there. So he started praying and fasting, interceding for his nation. Now let's look at verse 20 now to 22. As a result of that, what happened? Verse 20. I went on praying. I'm reading from verse 20 to 22 now. I went on praying, confessing my sins and the sins of my people Israel and pleading with the Lord my God to restore his holy temple. While I was praying, Gabriel, now an angel appeared to him, whom I had seen in, in the earlier vision, came flying down to where I was. It was the time for the evening sacrifice to be offered. He explained, Daniel, I have come here to help you understand the prophecy. So number one, an angel came and helped him to understand even the prophecies of old. By the time you now go to, and I, and I will not, by the time I will not permit us to read this, please write it down. Daniel chapter 10, verse two to three. Daniel chapter 10, verse two to three, which was where that same angel came again and said to him that his prayer had been answered. And this happened because he fasted and prayed. So number two, why, when should we fast? When, when in danger, when there is a problem? But the point I'll make is that let's not wait until there's a problem before we start to fast. That is why I will say this now. As a Christian, you and I must have at least one day per week that you set aside for fasting. At least one day per week. So if you have not, if you don't have that already, please, I want you to prayerfully, after this class, prayerfully identify a particular day of every week. What that means is that, like I said before, in terms of your, your um, quiet time, that you have, you have a day or a particular time every day where you are praying. And then in the week, seven days of the week, pick a particular day, maybe Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, whatever, Saturday, you have a particular day. You set aside that you are fasting every day I mean, I mean that day of every week for the rest of your life. So you, what you're trying to do, you are not waiting until problem comes before you are fasting. It becomes a part of your life. However you want to do it, maybe you are doing absolute fast, you're doing the normal one. But let it be that a particular day of the week you have set aside, consecrated to God to pray, to fast, to wait on God. That's how to be a true Christian. So in the time of danger, if you read the book of Jonah, chapter 1, verse 17, this was when, after God had told Jonah to go to Nineveh, and then he, he, he decides to go to Tarshish. And then he went to the boat, and then the boat was, there was a storm, they threw him into the water, and then a big fish swallowed him. That was a big problem. He was in that fish, in, in, the, in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. 
he prayed. Of course, he wasn't eating. He fasted for three days and three nights. Because it wasn't, it wasn't a time of problem. You will see that in the book of Job, chapter 1, verse 17. Uh, sorry, I beg your pardon. Jonah, chapter 1, verse 17. Jonah, chapter 1, verse 17. And then Jonah, chapter 2, verse 1. Jonah, chapter 1, verse 17. And Jonah, chapter 2, verse 1. And then you also see um, Paul. When Paul was, was in a voyage, and then there was a great storm, serious problem as well. In the book of Acts chapter 27, verse 21 to 25. Acts 27, 21 to 25. And at that time, they, they, they also fasted. After he had fasted, he came up and then he began to speak to the people. He said, you guys should have listened to me. If you are listening to me, this, 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 this ship will, will, not, will, not, will not be losing this ship. But he had prayed, he had fasted, waited on the Lord. Because that time was a time of danger. That storm lasted for, for, for days or is that about two weeks? I can't remember. And it was a serious one that the Bible says that they, they didn't see the sun throughout the period. It was dark. It was like it was night throughout, those, throughout the time of the storm. Serious storm. It was a serious attack from the pit of darkness. Trying to prevent Paul from getting to, to Rome. That's a different discussion for another day. Number three, when you are about, when you need to take a crucial decision, as you saw, you know, the book of Esther that we read, Esther chapter four. Also take that down. We read it before. You can take it down. Esther chapter four, verse fifteen to sixteen. Esther needed to take a, ser a serious, life-threatening decision. Esther was not was not supposed to go to approach the king. But here Esther is, the king is not calling for Esther to come and he, he, she needed to go and present a case for his people. And he, she knows that if she goes to present herself before the king without the call of the king, they would kill her. And she knew that she had to take that decision. So before she took that serious decision, she had to go and pray and fast for three days and three nights. No wonder when the king saw her, instead of the king asking to go, to go and kill her, the king stretched forth as his scepter and asked her to come. And even she found favor because she had prayed and fasted. So when you need to take a serious decision, please consider fasting and prayer. Number four, when, when someone is sick and in need of deliverance, you need to fast. You saw what we read before, Mark chapter 9, verse 29. Jesus said to his disciples, this type of sickness cannot go until you have prayed and fasted. So when in need of deliverance and when, when someone is sick and you need deliverance, please apply prayer and fasting. Number five, we're going to close. Um, we, are, we have eight points to cover and we'll close. Number five, when praying for a great task, Sorry, when preparing for a great task. For example, it may, not, it, may, it may not necessarily be ministry work. Maybe you are you have just been promoted from one level to a very high level. And you know that level you have been promoted to, you are, you are going to face serious challenges. Before you start, go and pray and fast. Go and pray and fast. I remember in my own case, because I, ne I never planned to be a pastor, okay? I never, I, I came to United Kingdom to study and then I finished studying and I started working and I was enjoying my work. But that year, 2016, when I was called to be a pastor, I was destabilized. But I knew that for me to do this, I need to go and seek the face of God. So before I started, I took time out to go and pray and I fasted to seek the face of God, to hear what God has got to say. And then God spoke. And then because God spoke, I had the confidence. So in this journey now, if anything happens along the line, if I, if I come across any challenge along, this, along the line, I will always fall back to what God said. I will always fall back to what God said because I heard he said. Not because one person said I should go and pastor, because what God said. So, because no matter what, what um, situation you find yourself, challenges will surely come. 
when the challenge comes, what will keep you going? It will be the word of God. So when you are preparing to, you are preparing to enter a great task, or you are preparing for revival, you must fast and pray. Let's take a cue from our Lord Jesus Christ. Please write down Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 to 3. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 to 3. The Bible tells us that Jesus, after he was baptized, at that point, he was commissioned for his own task, his ministry. After he came out, the Bible says he was led, he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. There, he fasted 40 days and 40 nights. He was there 40 days and 40 nights, fast, praying, seeking the face of God before he began his ministry. Number six, when asking God for intervention, you want God to intervene in a particular situation, you must ask God in fasting. You must fast. Let's quickly look at Nehemiah chapter one, verse three and four. The book of Nehemiah chapter one, verse three and four. I'll be quick about this. I'm conscious of the time. Nehemiah chapter one, verse three and four. Again, Nehemiah was, was an official in the Babylonian um, kingdom. Don't forget that now that, now that at that time, Israel was, was already going back. The, the, the first set of Israelites had already returned to, um, to put things straight. The book of Nehemiah should have come after the book of Daniel. If, we, if, the, book of, if the Bible was going to be arranged in the, the same order. So that book of Daniel would precede the book of Nehemiah. Because after what happened in Daniel was what happened in Nehemiah. Because the, some people had been freed to go back to Israel. But Nehemiah was still, was still an official, an Israelite, was still an official in Babylon. But he heard about what happened, what is happening back home. And he was troubled. Nehemiah chapter 1 verse 3. So then they told me that those who had survived, those who, and were back in homeland, those who had gone back to Israel and had survived, were in great difficulty. And that the foreigners who lived nearby looked down on them. They, are, sorry, they also told me that the walls of Jerusalem were still broken down and that the gates had not been restored since the time they were born. Because what happened is that when Babylon came and they took them captive, they burned the city, they destroyed the walls and they, they left the place in ruins, destroyed the temple, took things away from the temple, they left the country in ruins. So when the people returned, they came back to saw a ruined country. So after some time, Nehemiah was still serving the king of Babylon. And then he heard what is happening in his own country. He was disturbed. He was, and then verse four, when I heard all this, I sat down and wept. For several days I mourned and did not eat. In other words, he fasted. I prayed to God, sought the face of God to hear what God would say and he got direction. And he also got favor from the king. Then they went back, got permission to go back to Jerusalem to go and build the wall of the city. So he needed divine intervention. He sought the face of God in prayer and fasting and he got divine intervention. In fact, the king favored him so much that everything that he required to build the wall was provided. It was provided by Babylon. It didn't, they didn't just provide it. They delivered it there. They got people to carry those things on their behalf and to go and deliver those people, to even support them. Divine intervention. So when you look, we're, we're crying to God for a favor. You must be ready to fast and pray. Number seven, second to the last one. When interceding for other people, as we saw in the book of Daniel chapter three, Daniel understood by books that Israel should have left the captivity, should have gone back to their land. And he decided to pray for his country, to intercede for his country, and he prayed and he fasted. So 
if you have someone that you are praying for, add fasting to it, and God will hear in the name of Jesus. And then the last point on this note today, because we'll continue tomorrow, with so that our spirit will readily be alive when God speaks. So that our spirit can be alive. So that we can be sensitive to what God is saying. So that we can be sensitive to what God is saying. You see, the book of Isaiah chapter 6, the Bible says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord, highly and lifted up. He saw the train, what everything, God gave him a vision of what was happening in heaven. He saw, he saw, saw the cherubim, he saw them and all those things. And all of a sudden, he heard. He didn't just see. He heard. He heard the voice. The voice says, who shall go for us? Because he heard, he then volunteered, here I am, send me. Because he heard. If he did not hear, and what he had and what he saw that day was definite to the life of Isaiah. If you read the book of Isaiah from Isaiah chapter 1 and chapter 5, we discover that Isaiah as a person was a different person before chapter 6. But after that vision in chapter 6, read the book of Isaiah, read from Isaiah chapter 7 onwards. You see that the book of Isaiah was, it was different. Please try, go and read it. Isaiah chapter 1 to uh, chapter five. Then start reading from verse seven or chapter seven onwards. He started seeing the vision of Jesus Christ. Is it, no, there was no prophet in the Old Testament that spoke clearly about Jesus Christ more than Isaiah. And why? Because he saw the vision of God and he had his ministry transformed because he had. So, we fast so that our spirit will readily be alive when God speaks to us. And I'll close by reading, and I think we read this before, Acts chapter 13, verse 2 to 4. Acts chapter 13, verse 2 to 4. We read it before. Let's quickly read it again as we close with this. Acts 13, verse 2 to 4. Since, uh, oh, yes, go ahead. As the minister to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Bar Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called him. Then having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. Okay. Is that verse 4, please? Oh, so being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there, they sailed to Cyprus. Good. Praise the Lord. So they heard distinctly what God wanted them to do. How beautiful it is for us to know what God wants us to do. And to receive the grace to do it. So one of the greatest problems that human beings have is not money. It's not food. It's not what to wear. It's what to do. That's one of the greatest problems that we have, not knowing what to do. Because not having food to eat, it may not be a problem, but not knowing where to get the food, what to do to get the food is the major problem. Not what would I do? Where would I get money from? Who, who should I speak to? But when we begin to hear the voice of God and the God begins to move us to the point that it tells us the, even the minutest, if there's a word like that, information. Go and speak to this person. God said to, to Elijah in the time of famine, says, see, go to the house of a widow. He said, I have commanded a widow to feed you. So Elijah didn't just go to any other place to get food. He didn't go to beg. He knew where to go, the exact place to go because God had told him where to go. And he went to the house of that widow. And that was where he was fed. Because he heard the voice of God. And like I said, we will stop here today. We will continue tomorrow. And tomorrow we will start looking at how to operate biblical fasting. Now we have talked about the theory. 
tomorrow we start talking about how we practically fast, how we should practically fast and pray. Those are the things we're going to be doing tomorrow. I noticed that uh, my brother, um, possibly due to our, his connection, went out. What I said earlier is that tomorrow we continue, and the items we're going to look at tomorrow is firstly we talk about the practical bit, how to pray. Sorry, how to how to operate biblical fasting, how to do it, and then what fasting does to our health. After that, we then look at prayer. By God's grace. We'll close that topic tomorrow by the special grace of God. I pray God will bless us mightily in the name of Jesus. Do we have any question or do we have any contribution before we pray? Any question or any contribution? Okay, I don't seem to have any. Can I just quickly give this announcement before we pray? By God's grace, by midnight, about midnight um, today, the UK time will change. What it means is that um, uh, we would move forward by one hour. So now that it is, um, we normally we start at three o'clock, uh, which is four o'clock Nigerian time. What it means is that Nigerian four o'clock will be um, the four o'clock in UK from tomorrow. So can I ask Sister Winnie, what, what time is it in Kenya now again? Mm. What's the time in Kenya now? It's 7.35. 7.35, so it means that- 7.35, um, seven. Okay, so it means, good, thank you, Ma. It means that um, Kenya is three hours ahead of UK. Mm -hmm. okay. So what it means is that from tomorrow, mm -hmm. we, we will now be, we will only be two hours behind of Kenya. And in, in, with, with Nigeria, it will be the same time. So what that means is that we will stick to the same time you do it. So your same time, I think um, the, the three o'clock in UK would be um, six o'clock in Kenya. Six. Yeah, okay, six in good. Kenya. So what it means is that we would still start, we will do your, it will be six o'clock in Kenya. It will be mm -hmm. four o'clock in, in, um, in, um, in Nigeria. Uh -huh. Okay. So what we would do is that rather than starting at three o'clock, because we normally start at three in UK, which correlates with your mm -hmm. six and four, mm -hmm. we would now mm -hmm. start at four o'clock in, um, in um, we will start four o'clock here. It would then correlate with your six o'clock and the yeah. four o'clock in Nigeria. So the point is that your time will not change. It is us that would tweak our time to suit what is changing. Is that okay? okay. That's fine. Okay, so please bear that in mind. Uh, so it will be the okay. same time for you, both mm -hmm. Nigeria and the and um, in Kenya. But our mm -hmm. time will move forward to suit this, the the regular time for you guys. All right. Okay. So let's. Do, do you have any questions, Sister Winnie? No. None. Okay. So, shall we bow our head? Can I ask um, my wife um, to please pray for us as we close? Mm -hmm. um, In yes. Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you for today. Lord, we thank you for teaching us. We thank you for opening our eyes. We thank you for, for educating us. We thank you, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Amen. We thank you for opening our eyes to the importance of prayer and fasting. That the Lord, we cannot but be grateful to today. I would say glory to your name in the name of Jesus. Amen. Lord, we ask for God that you all you give us all strength, even in the place of prayer, in the place of fasting, waiting on you. In the name of Jesus, Amen. you will give us grace to fast. And even when we are fasting, that we will be focused on to you and look up to you and you alone in the name of Jesus. Amen. Lord, we commit tomorrow's meeting into your hands that you will take control in the name of Jesus. Amen. And as we log out and continue our, our different activities, we ask that you will be with us all in the name of Jesus. Amen. And above all, that our lives will not remain the same in the name of Amen. Jesus. 
In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you very much. Thank, and thank you. you, everyone, for taking time to attend this last. Thing. Sorry, um, additional eight minutes uh, have been taken away from your, your time. Thank you very much. I hope it's okay. been super wow. Have okay. a wonderful rest of the day, and I hope to see you tomorrow by the special. Reason. God okay. bless thank you. you. Amen. Enjoy your weekend. Amen. Bye. Bye, Sister Bye. 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 Sonny Emmanuel. Bye, sir. Bye. 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 Bye, Daddy. Bye.